Hello, welcome back. Today I'm going to show you how I modeled a cute isometric kitchen scene. Here's what it's going to look like when we're done with it. As you can see, I'm starting by adding a cube again. By the way, I'm pressing Shift A, 1, 2. That's the fastest way to add a cube. If you've seen any of my previous tutorials, you've noticed that this is how I always start. But what about the default cube? You were probably going to ask. I've deleted the default cube a long time ago, and then I saved that to a startup file. That is a super cool feature that Blender has. You can make any changes that you want to Blender itself. You can add any geometry to your startup file that you want. You can add a camera, for example. I have a camera in my startup file and a backdrop and a primitive light. And I have Nishita Sky Texture set up so that whenever I press render, whatever I was modeling would look good. Here I'm working on the composition of the scene. I want this kitchen to be rustic, very cozy, a lot of wooden things, a lot of imperfect shapes. At this stage, when deciding on the composition, it's very important for me to figure out what details I absolutely have to have and which ones I can omit. Since we're working with limited space here, I can only fit so many things before it becomes cluttered. There are a couple of reasons to consider while deciding on the scale of a project like this. In this particular case, I knew that this was going to become a 10 to 15 minute long tutorial. So I didn't want to add too many objects because then the time lapse would be just absolutely unfollowable. Another reason why I wanted to keep this on a simpler side was consideration of showing it on social media, something that I already talked about in the previous video. Besides that, I also don't want to fill the entire image with the same amount of details everywhere. I'm trying to use level of detail as a way to draw viewers' attention to certain parts of the image. That's why I'm trying to leave some empty spaces in the scene too, just as a place for your eyes to rest. Here, as you can see, I've decided that having just a fridge, an oven, a sink, and a table is enough for it to indicate that it's a kitchen. Now that I've decided which pieces of furniture I want to have, I'm adding some details to them. And still, I'm not trying to add all the details at once. Let's take this particular table, for example. I just left it as a couple of blocks next to each other and moved on to modeling a sink. I don't want to do double work, so I'm experimenting here. If I added all the details to the table and then decided that this is not the type of table that's working for the scene, that would have been unfortunate. To get accepted into my university, everyone had to draw a head of a Greek statue. And I spent about a year preparing for it. The thing I remember the most from that year is our teacher getting really mad at us for adding details like hair strands before building the general shape. Like I said before, it's important to make decisions based on your camera angle, on your current composition, on the way you know people are gonna see your art. At least that's how I feel. That's why at an early stage I feel like it's important to not overcommit to a certain element in the scene. If you've already spent some time adding details to a thing, you are much less likely to realize that that's the thing that's not working and maybe remove it from the scene entirely if you have to. As you can see, this table is missing two legs. Instead, it has this cylindrical thing that it's propped on. What is it? To be honest, I'm not 100% sure. I think it might have been a bucket when I first came up with this idea. Now that I think about it, maybe it's some sort of a canister where you're proofing the dough or maybe making jam. It doesn't quite matter to me. And here's why. It doesn't matter what it is. It matters that it's cylindrical shape. I looked at the entire composition together and realized that everything is very rectangular. I knew that I wanted to make this fridge in this retro style, so it would be smoother than a perfect rectangle, but still very rectangular. So I thought we were missing something round, something different, something for your eye to notice. Here I'm finally adding the details to the table, now that I know that it works in this composition. As you can see, I'm just adding a couple of edge loops with Ctrl R and moving them around. 
I want to give these wooden blanks a little bit more of a, a regular shape. Another cool little detail that you can add to wooden objects is that little dent I added right there. To make that, I just selected a vertex in the middle of the plank, press Ctrl B to bevel, and then Ctrl T to triangulate the resultant dent. No rustic kitchen is complete without an oven and a stovetop, so that's what I'm working on here. There's obviously nothing cozier than a warm light coming out of the oven, because it also probably smells very nice, because something delicious is being cooked there. I probably could have modeled whatever is being cooked there, but like I said, I'm trying not to add too many details to one piece when the other ones are not detailed at all. As you can see, I added the inside faces in the oven. That is because not all the programs support double-sided faces, at least by default. Blender does render double-sided faces, but if you were to import this to Unity, this object would look transparent from one side. Here I'm starting to add the stove top. Since it's a rustic kitchen, of course it has to be a gas stove. As you see, I use a lot of existing geometry. That is, I copy the geometry that existed to build something new with it. For example, like those ring things on the stovetop. I do that because it's much faster to copy geometry that is already perfectly aligned, that is usually in the center of where you want it to be. What you could do is create a new object each time you want to make something that is not connected to the rest of the model. You can go to object mode, press shift A and add a new primitive. Alternatively, you can make a separate island inside the object that you're working in. Same thing, in edit mode, press shift A and you're going to get a new island. The only problem with that is that both of those use 3D cursor as the origin point of the new object. 3D Cursor is an incredibly useful part of Blender. It helps to get an extra pivot point that you can change things based on. Let's say you wanted to rotate chairs around a circular table, or create something in the middle of the selection that you have. To do that, you would need to select Geometry, press Shift S, and choose Cursor to select it. And then, if you use Pivot Pi menu that is located on greater than symbol on your keyboard, you would be able to change the pivot to this 3D cursor. It's a very useful feature and I use it a lot. You've probably noticed how I keep mentioning shortcuts for everything that I do. Blender is very shortcut oriented, probably the most shortcut oriented program that I'm using. I know a lot of people coming from other 3D software get a little bit annoyed at how many things you need to remember to begin working with Blender. How many things are different compared to Maya, for example. I've never used Maya. I only used 3ds Max years ago and ARCHICAD and Google SketchUp when I was in university. So mostly architecture software, since I didn't really do any polygonal modeling back then. So I consider Blender to be my first polygonal 3D modeling software. And I think it's a blessing that I never used any other software to the point where I was really familiar with it. Because it seems much easier to just learn things for the first time, instead of relearning the things you were doing in a different way for years before that. So to me, Blender, being very shortcut oriented, is an amazing feature. Now I use shortcuts for almost everything, and they're just in my muscle memory. Before I used to sit there and try to press Shift A12 to make a cube as fast as I could, but now it just happens naturally. This way you don't spend much time thinking about how to use a software, and you can spend more time thinking what to make. Here I'm making minor tweaks to a glass material. Glass renders very differently in Cycles and Eevee. I'm rendering primarily with Cycles. And Cycles is a more realistic of two rendering engines available in Blender. So naturally, it's also more performance heavy. Being able to make adjustments that are visible in Cycles so quickly that you don't have to wait for them, so quickly that it's really easy to make glass look exactly the way you want it to look, 
That makes creation so much easier. The fact that you can easily iterate on the go. That is so key. You don't have to spend hours and hours, because realistically you wouldn't. What I would do is I would just tweak the glass material a little bit, get it to the point where I would be sort of happy with it, and just go with it. So it's not even the point of saving time. It's not like you would actually spend more and more and more time tweaking minor things like glass like this, compared to just not getting to that point, just not having tested that many options or that many colors. So maybe not getting to the result that you would be as satisfied with as you could have if you had a more powerful PC. So this is why I usually answer that it's complicated when I'm asked about how necessary is a very powerful computer for 3D modeling. Because it's not 100% necessary, depending on what you're working on and what program you're using. If you carefully optimize your scene, work on one object at a time, work primarily in low poly, you can get started with a pretty low spec PC. What a more powerful computer does is it helps you get the results you want faster. If you have been paying attention, and you might have looked in the top right corner where I have my hierarchy, you could see a lot of cubes. Cube 06, Cube 07, and so on. Here's the thing. I don't always name my objects. Here's why. In Blender, I usually select objects in the scene. I click on them in the 3D viewport. Very rarely do I need to know what the object is called for that. If I would be working in a team with more than one person, then of course I would name my objects. If somebody else needed to make sense of the file I'm working on, then of course I would name my objects. There are about three reasons for me to name my objects. One, if I'm working on a project for a client and I know I'm going to need to deliver the Blender file. Two, if I'm working on game assets that I'm going to be exporting to Unity, then I would care to name my objects because that's what the FBX is going to be called. Well, technically, it's going to be the name of the collection and not the objects, but that's a separate story. And the third one is right before I'm hiding an object. Since I don't use any form of version control other than just manually making a copy of a file every now and then, I usually end up having multiple copies of the same object at different stages of modeling in one file. So right before I'm about to make some big change that I might want to reconsider later, that I'm not sure about, I copy the object and name it X copy, and then I hide it. Because then I know I'm gonna need to be able to find it in the hierarchy. But obviously there is nothing wrong with naming your objects. If you've been naming your objects the whole time, go you. I made some tweaks after the recording, but here's the final result of our cute kitchen scene. Thank you for watching the video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below. I'll see you in the next video when we're going to be modeling the next mini room. Bye!